So yeah, we, right. we have to apologize. Our, our last presenter was called away overseas uh, very unexpectedly last week. So we're uh, we're short an expert on manageability, but the rest of us are going to try to fake it. So <laughs> you'll see that as we go. Uh, okay, everybody. Hello and welcome uh, to the fog to the, to the show, and also welcome to this architecture panel. So this is uh, called Elements of an Open Interoperable Architecture for Fog. And my name is Chuck Byers. I work for Cisco. I'm also the chairman of the Open Fog Architecture Working Group, and I'll be moderating this panel. Um, let's see if we can go forward here and take a look at who else is on the panel. Ah, okay. Uh, Maria, would you like to introduce yourself for anything? Or are we just uh, going to, we, we can do that as we go. Okay, Maria's going to talk about communications. Uh, Jim is going to talk about software infrastructure and messaging. John is our security expert. And uh, Caddy, who's supposed to sit in that chair right there, was going to talk about management, but we're all going to take over on that. Uh, hopefully, we'll each talk for, I don't know, six or eight minutes on our tasks. And then we'll leave a little time at the end for questions and answers. Sound good? All right. So this is the obligatory overview slide, kind of an executive summary. The definition of FOG, as agreed to by the Open FOG Consortium Board of Directors, it's a system level architecture that extends compute networking and storage capabilities from the cloud to the edge of IoT networks. So it's like the full capabilities of the cloud, but you know, think about it as closer to the ground. That's why uh, we coined the term FOG computing uh, about four or five years ago as a result of that sort of analogy, closer to the ground. Uh, we, we think that it's a superset. Open FOG at least defines FOG as a superset of, of some other edge architectures, especially the ones that might be more proprietary to a, an individual vertical like, like MEC uh, or IIC which would be uh, service providers and industrial applications of these edge technologies, respectively. Uh, but it's uh, you know, more modes, more functions, more capabilities. Uh, Cisco's got a projection that around 40% of the IoT traffic that's likely to be on networks in a few years will be passing through or processed by fog nodes. Uh, we're very interested in this, this open, interoperable market model to succeed. So the architecture that we're working on is very much into the spirit of openness and the spirit of interoperability, the spirit of multi-user capabilities and so on, multi-tenancy and all that. Uh, there's, there's some uh, key capabilities of FOG that we think are really essential for many IoT applications, and, and you'll see them listed there, and we'll, we'll go into some of that in somewhat more detail in subsequent slides. So that's just the, the, the one minute overview of FOG. Here's a, a list of some of the verticals. This is fairly congruent with the work that 451 Research presented earlier this morning. And uh, this happened to be the list that FOG used two years ago uh, when the Open FOG Consortium was trying to figure out what our architecture should be best at. One of our choices was choose a vertical, industrial, uh, oil, gas, whatever we might choose, and, and design an architecture exactly for that. The problem with that is a lot of the really interesting use cases fall between these verticals. So, for example, if you've got a ground support network for drones, is that a smart city thing because the ground systems are part of a smart city, or is that a transportation thing? We think that we need to be sure that we manage all of the interstitial spaces between all of these various verticals and use cases. And in fact, Open Fog has just this morning published a set of four really interesting, very detailed use cases, and those are being used to drive the detailed requirements of the Open Fog architecture. They're freely downloadable on the Open Fog website after you register. A little bit of uh, background on IoT in general. There's this thing called the DIKW model, where you've got raw data falling in and out of sensors and actuators on the bottom, and you distill it to more potency as you go up towards the top of this pyramid. And more business benefit occurs as you go higher up that pyramid. We uh, believe that each of those information transformation boundaries that occur on this model. So, so you know, right there, right there, right there. Each of those is potentially an opportunity for a lot of fog computing work. There's this question about distribution versus centralized architectures. And uh, about every 10, 12 years, this pendulum swings back and forth. And you can see we, we've got about seven of those pendulum swings uh, listed in the, the history of uh, computation and, 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 and analysis. Uh, the very important point to notice is, is today, or maybe last year, we were swung pretty hard over towards cloud computing and more of a centralized model. And now, just as history would suggest, we're on the way back 
where fog computing, mobile edge computing, IIC kind of computing, all of these things are going to be the next generations of the way the world does business. And we really believe it's just that important. So I'm going to talk, that, that, that's my uh, couple minutes of introduction. I'm going to talk briefly about architecture. So uh, what architecture is, is really about the, the high level view that engineers and implementers use to drive the, the stuff that they work on. Uh, so the need for fog is described in this architecture and we can talk about, let's see if we can get this build to work here. Oh, there it mm -hmm. goes. Okay, uh, can't do everything in the cloud because we've got latency challenges. Uh, cloud is not mobile. There might be geographic focus or geographic boundary concerns of sending data to a remote cloud node. Network bandwidth uh, up and down is very uh, constrained in many cases. And there might be reliability, security, and privacy challenges. So, so those reasons, we can't probably do all that IoT computation in the cloud. Similarly, we probably can't run it all on intelligent endpoints because they may have energy and space and capacity and reliability and modularity and security challenges. So the answer is, let's have this intermediate set of hierarchical fog nodes, and that's the place where we're going to deposit the computation, networking, and storage capabilities that the next generation IoT applications will require. And the architecture that the Open Fog Consortium has generated over the last years is in direct response to this model of how to address those challenges. The architecture is driven by what we call the eight pillars of fog computing. And these are described in gory detail in the Open Fog Reference Architecture document, which is downloadable freely from openfogconsortium.org. And each of these is given a few page summary of what it is, why it matters, how it applies to fog architecture. I obviously don't have time to go into all eight pillars here. Uh, the Open Fog Consortium's architecture work continues, and there may actually be a couple of additional pillars on this the next time you see the slide. The ones that we're considering adding uh, have to do with interoperability, which is similar to openness, but not exactly the same. And uh, we'd like to put something that's a little more uh, descriptive of performance, the, all the latencies and uh, service level agreement kinds of things. We think that they may deserve to be pillars. So, so over the year, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that, and we may actually see 10 pillars the next time you see this, this presentation. But, but for now, the architecture is being driven by these as the highest layer of uh, use cases. This is the reference architecture block diagram as defined in the, that document that I described before. Uh, notice, please, that it's fairly hierarchical. It's fairly rigidly ordered. It's a little colorful. Uh, we have uh, sort of hardware-related things down here and the abstraction models associated with the hardware things. Here's sort of the central infrastructure in dark blue. That's the, the stuff that feels a little like an operating system, protocol stacks, analytics capabilities, and so on. Uh, there's a manageability layer on top of it, and the shapes of these, these zigzags are, are kind of important when you step back and think about how all these things fit together. And then there's the application space on top. This is the, the stuff that's actually providing user value. And they all fold neatly together, lots of interfaces represented by these white lines. And then uh, there's about five cross-cutting concerns, these things that are shown in these vertical stripes down here. The important thing to know about cross-cutting concerns is that they apply to all boxes. So one of the most important ones that John will tell us about in a second is security. If you don't have end-to-end -end security all up and down that uh, hierarchy, you're not going to have any security, right? So, so the idea is that these cross-cutting concerns, management, uh, analytics, control capabilities, uh, business fo focus, and, and this performance question, those things are all impactful on all layers of this block diagram. Uh, the last bit of commercial message here is that there's a 162-page white paper available at that URL, and that's the reference architecture that is currently driving this effort. We're in the process of refining it the next stage. There's a set of the four use cases that I described that you should take a quick look at. They're technically rigorous. They're not flowery marketing use cases. These are, there's, there's a code fragment in one of them, for example. <laughs> and, uh, and those use cases are going to drive a rigorous normative requirements document that will be published in about January. 
And then that will drive the next generation of this block diagram, where, where all of those white lines will be fully defined where the APIs are, where the interfaces are. All these boxes will be blown out into the constituent components. And hopefully, when we get to that point very early next year, you'll have everything that you need to complete your FOG architectures, your FOG implementations, and your FOG network deployments. Doesn't mean you can't start now. This, as it exists right now in that 162-page document, is totally adequate for FOG development and deployment. But if you want fully interoperable, all, uh, all things thought about, then uh, that information is forthcoming in just a couple of months. That's the end of the architecture talk. Let me uh, transition over to Maria, who will talk about communications in FOG. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Maria Gorlatova. I am an associate research scholar at Princeton. And over the last year, I've been co-chairing the communications working group of the consortium. In fact, my co-chair just walked into the room uh, in the go. valley. Um, so communications in FOG come at the node level and also impact all of the cross-cutting concerns that Chuck mentioned. At the node level, we need to make sure that the individual FOG nodes can actually physically talk to each other. And this means, in certain cases, making special provisions for things like uh, ultra-low latency or high bandwidth for very high throughput. At the node level, we also need to make sure that the FOG nodes can talk to devices or things, which may require going over a protocol abstraction layer if the things are low power or if they're running over legacy protocols. Communications also impacts all of the cross-cutting concerns. Uh, FOG is uh, distributed and distributed means networked. So communications come into play where you talk about performance and scale or manageability. The interplay of security and communications is very important for making sure that the end-to-end FOG deployment is uh, secure in all of its aspects. For communications, certain scenarios are straightforward and certain are more challenging. The basic communication use case is simply supporting distributed computing uh, and storage in FOG. That is required by uh, pretty much all of the FOG uh, applications that are existing and that are upcoming. Several cases also require additional provisioning. For example, we need to make sure to support ultra-low latency scenarios, which represent some of the distinguishing use cases for FOG and certain applications. We also need to be looking into the future and making sure that we support emerging applications, such as 5G, autonomous driving, and augmented and virtual reality which all place their own important uh, constraints and important requirements on comms. While looking into the future, we also need to be mindful of the past. Uh, communications never exist in a vacuum. We uh, not only need to think about brand new deployments, but also always need to be thinking about deployments at a brownfield that are coexisting with what uh, is already out there. Our approach to defining communications is to look at different planes and different directions of comms. Amongst plane separations, we are considering uh, the traditional architecture of uh, data control and management planes. And amongst the direction of communications, we are considering uh, nodes uh, talking to a peer node, nodes talking to the cloud, and nodes talking to devices or things. Throughout all of these elements of the architecture space, the core goal is for the communications to be fully aligned with the pillars that Chuck has mentioned. Um, all of this has to support uh, all these core, um, it all needs to be consistent. We also are very careful about making sure that our design is aligned with existing protocols and existing frameworks. And this is uh, always, of course, a concern for comms. We, uh, to go from uh, scenarios to capabilities, we are imagining having a set of baseline capabilities and then a set of module layers that may be needed for some applications. So a lot of uh, what is envisioned for FOG uh, is fairly straightforward from the communications point of view. 
applications like a smart home or simple infog data processing require secure, reliable, distributed communications. On the other hand, many applications require more. For example, video surveillance, autonomous driving, and big data upload require support for very high throughput. Movie streaming and augmented and virtual reality, where nodes that are close to each other often need the very similar content, require support for multicast. And then safety applications, uh, be it an autonomous driving, uh, health, or oil and gas, require a set of additional uh, solutions to reflect their mission critical nature. I'll hand it off to Jim. Well done, Brian. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, my name is Jim White, everybody. I'm uh, with Dell uh, Technologies. I work in the office of the CTO, and I'm also the, um, uh, the architect and uh, orchestrator of a, a product, open source product called EdgeX Foundry um, that uh, Dell initially built, and we've contributed now. We've got a, a community of about 60 companies working on that. Um, so obviously, uh, software infrastructure and um, messaging are very, very important to me and to, to the projects that we're working on. Uh, and what I'd like to try and take you through right now is, is kind of our perspective from a, a, an open fog perspective, but dropping off the open part and just saying fog in general uh, uh, to give you some sense of where we see some um, important elements in the software infrastructure and a messaging stack. Um, as Chuck alluded to, our, our boxology diagram here um, has the software pieces at the top. There's three layers up there. Um, those layers probably change, uh, as Chuck alluded to, and, and I'll talk about, well, what's representing those right now. Um, we also are very interested in some of the cross-cutting concerns. In fact, all the cross-cutting concerns, but most importantly, uh, messaging and manageability are, are two that are kind of things that are front and center in our minds right now, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the naming, as we're finding in this world, um, is critical, and admittedly, we have some work to do there. Uh, there's, you know, what do you call some of these things is a bit, um, a bit of a challenge right now. And so when you look at the software layer uh, and we think about application services, well, what does that mean? Uh, that to us is where a lot of the applications, the end user applications are going to reside. Um, this is where um, your services, or as I like to say from, from our EdgeX perspective, your microservices uh, might live. They're actually gonna perform those needs you have out there on that oil platform or in that HVAC system that's in that strip mall. Uh, below that, we have what we call application support. Think about any kind of um, platform where you have uh, supporting needs that cut across all the application layer, databases, messaging, things of that nature. And I'll try to give you one prime example of what fits into that application support layer in just a second. Then you've dropped down into things like node management um, and uh, software backplane. Again, this is where some of the naming gets a little bit tricky. Um, we're not quite sure that that's a name that's gonna stick, but what do we have in that layer? Things like the operating system, your drivers, your firmware, your virtualization, containerization. In and below that, you also start to get into the manageability of the system, and that's where we're finding a great deal of complexity. We're not talking about a single platform here. We're not talking about even a homogeneous set of platforms. Every one is a little bit different. Is a PLC a fog node? Is the cloud server a fog node? Hmm, the answer there is probably yes in all categories and everything in between. So the capabilities and the things that we're gonna run our software and systems on vary so greatly, we have to actually start to think about even the management of these very, very differently, and I'll talk about that here in a second as well. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, some of the distinctions we're trying to draw are around things like what is an application versus what is an application service, and how do we build interoperability around that? So from our perspective, looking at some sort of um, just distributed type of environment, you, you have some sort of service or microservice type of architecture, but you need some sort of capability like uh, a registry and some sort of message pipe so that those can communicate with one another but not necessarily have to have a, a, a tight coupling between them. Um, so that's where we start to get into some of the challenges of how do you start to define that. One of my favorite examples in dealing with software in the fog is, think about analytics. Everybody's heard the term analytics, right? And what does analytics mean to you? If you're running at the lowest edge, say you are running at a PLC, you probably don't have that many resources versus the cloud. You've got a ton of resources. How do we put analytics at the edge and still have that same placeholder be analytics in the cloud? How do you run something like a simple rules engine at the edge and then have IBM Watson at the cloud? 
have something like Sastri's foghorn somewhere out there in the middle. How do you define that in a way that's interoperable, exchange data and services amongst all those in a way that really works and hums together in this very complex set of um, orchestrated systems? We've also started to get into the definition of what does fog node mean? And I know these are seeing eye charts and it's not meant to get you deep into the details of what a physical, logical, or virtual node is, but what we're starting to explore as part of the software infrastructure is what does the actual platform it is that we're running on mean? As we're finding out, as I mentioned, things from PLC all the way up to cloud have to kind of be defined and then you've got all sorts of virtualization, containerization layers that may be there or may not be there. Virtualized types of environments versus physical platforms. Each one requires a little bit different software infrastructure type of needs that we're having to look at. So those are the challenges that we've accepted as part of the software infrastructure group and the messaging working group and that's certainly what we're really focusing on. And I think with that, yep, off to John. Thank you, Jim. Well done. Hi, I'm John Zhao. Um, I actually wear several hats. You know, um, currently I'm a professor at the uh, National General University in Taiwan. But before that, I actually was with BBN and worked with uh, Steve Ken uh, in the uh, IPsec working group. Uh, we write some of the things I was involved in the policy management of IPsec. And uh, now I'm also uh, being work with uh, Frank. I think Frank is in, in, in our account, in our audience. Uh, uh, to lead the uh, security working group. Uh, before that, I working with Bridget on that as well. I have to say that um, the security uh, working group is really a team effort. I'm privileged to work with them. Uh, before I say anything about the detail, I also want to make, uh, announce two activities in this uh, conference. Uh, one is this afternoon, actually, we have published a position paper, the security working group as a whole, I published a position paper, open for security approach and requirements. Uh, in the academic session, so there I would probably have a little bit more time to talk about the details. Second is tomorrow, actually, we will have a panel discussion with uh, our various members of the security working group to talk about uh, what is for computing in general and its impact of IoT security. So this, that one is not only about open fork, that one is about how fork or edge computing can help IoT in the new era, how to en enhance their security. So hope that those two would give you additional information on this subject. So of course, uh, security is mentioned everywhere. Um, you know, and whenever you talk about IoT, whenever you talk about uh, cloud and uh, fog and edge computing, people mention over security as an important aspect. Um, not only I think it's important, but also it's become complex, as uh, Jim has mentioned, heterogeneity, different kind of uh, brownfield operations, kind of like stretch us to the limit. I highlighted a few things that is actually now um, we are really thinking about. The first and foremost is how to make sure that our security is also work with interoperability. Um, that one we are talking about how to make sure so-called quote-unquote end-to-end security can become viable. And also the other one is to create some kind of dynamics. We can see that people always want to, especially in fog, more than in cloud, to make the whole architecture incrementally de deployable, even mobile, okay, ad hoc. So how does this also impact security? That's the thing that we are thinking about. So the way that we, uh, the whole entire security working group was tackling this thing is we really compartmentalize it. Um, you know, this is, you know, people that are familiar with security, of course, see that this is a very natural way to divide it. We first of all talk about how to provide end-to-end -end security, and second is talking about how to manage it. But since this thing is dynamic, so we not only manage it, we also have to uh, monitor it. And hopefully even there will be some kind of closed loop between the monitoring and the management. And underneath that, actually, we are talking about a fog-centric approach. We are talking about how to secure the fog node first, and then propagate the security up the level from the virtualization, and then out. Uh, to connect between different fault nodes and finally obtain end-to-end -end security. And at the, along the thing, we are thinking about data security um, in conjunction with communication security. So let me go through the three different aspects of that. The first one, as I mentioned, is really about no security. This is the kind of like the anchor point. And the anchor point by the anchor point is really first about, about platform security. We talk a lot about uh, in our security working group about how to ensure that we have the root of trust or at least hardware assisted root of trust. And then um, 
with a standard set of uh, crypto function, we are now working with the board to hopefully develop a common set of crypto function among different regions, and then how to um, make the specification function requirement similar to uh, the common criteria or ISA approach so that it can be evaluated you know, at a later stage. From that, then we percolated up into the virtual machine security. And finally, the end point, of course, is how to create trusted execution environment that can be used to execute uh, your VMware or containers. The second part is, as I say, we permeate that out to connect different fault nodes together. As Maria has mentioned, we have the node to node security, node to cloud, and node to device security. From all these things, the one thing that we emphasize, you know, we strive for is we want to make sure that we have the common protocol, the IP protocol. You know, um, I know that this is extremely difficult in terms of interaction with the IoT devices, especially with uh, Brownfield devices. But luckily, when we talk to various clients, there seems to be a hope that in different uh, applications, people are doing IP adaptation. So we hope that that will be the basis for us to build our security. We're also thinking about how to build security using the MFV, using uh, network function virtualization. And that will be done later on in our security functional interface effort. Finally, the management part. Uh, we don't want to build a separate security management. We want to make forward the management back to manageability. So probably this is a good point that we will then uh, transfer to the manageability discussion. But just to point out that there are several things that are relevant to uh, security management, identity management. Uh, we are now managing not only the identity of the people, we are managing the identity of the, the devices, the identity of the, the, the TEE that you instantiate, and even maybe the process that running into it. Of course, analyzing it is credential and the trust management, and finally, the policy management. The one thing that we are talking about is we are working uh, very closely with the manageability working group, the messaging working group, in talking about how to build some kind of logical superstructure on top of our infrastructure to ensure the manageability become manageable. So that the proposition is, at the, at the current moment, an interoperability uh, domain concept and a service domain concept. But these are under development, under construction. And having said that, I think we should then pass on to manageability. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll wing it here. See how we go. Okay, so this is the uh, the manageability. Uh, it, it also includes the question of orchestration. So think about management as sort of like how you configure and maintain and organize the initial deployment of the nodes and their ongoing uh, swivel chair kinds of operations. And orchestration is more like the uh, the automatic capabilities of how applications are, are spread across the hierarchy. Uh, and please uh, speak up anybody on the panel if I'm missing important points here. Uh, so this is just an introductory overview of, of uh, you know, why fog computing is, is important and how management and orchestration fit into these problems. Um, certainly this, this whole question of real-time performance is a, is a big reason for fog computing. And if you don't have it correctly managed and correctly orchestrated, you've got no control over those properties. Uh, this, this whole question of distance and geography is, is you know, we're closer to the user now than, than even the edge would be. And uh, that makes the user sort of closer to the service. There are identity concerns, security concerns, concerns associated with resource utilization and fairness that are certainly part of that picture. Efficiency is, is really about how we're going to pool these resources. So what I don't want to do is overbuild, for example, those neighborhood fog nodes that uh, Hilton was talking about in Barcelona on a street corner. I don't necessarily want to over, overbuild those with enough processing and storage for all the different possible tenants, all the different city organizations and private organizations that might be using that fog node. Instead, I want to be able to pool and share those resources, like time-sharing computers or like the cloud does. Uh, that's going to require very significant orchestration and management capabilities. So those are some of the examples of efficiency and how that might work. Context is really important. Uh, we want to make sure that we can, for example, manage security through roots of trust, that we can identify bad actors, uh, track them back to their origin, and cut them off. These are very important parts of context. Cognition is really about the, the, the computation capabilities of FOG. 
And, and this is a client-centric architecture. So we're putting clients that are, that are computing things out on the edge and in, in the fog. And you know, make sure that all of the properties associated with that thought process are there. So is it private, is it secure, is it reliable? Uh, reliability is a very important consideration of management. Um, we want to make sure that we can detect and isolate and diagnose and repair faults. Uh, eventually, many of these fog applications are going to require five nines reliability, 99.999% uh, available. And uh, that's necessary for doing mission critical and especially life critical applications. Things like uh, connected vehicles, for example, will probably be life critical and, and require that part of the management to make that happen. Finally, there's this service management. There will be service level agreements and things well beyond traditional service level agreements associated with the behavior of fog. And we want to make sure that the manageability capabilities are really ready to coordinate and orchestrate that. Make sure that all applications get their fair share. Make sure that nobody's doing anything unsavory. And make sure that all of the expectations of the application users of this FOG infrastructure are correctly met. Um, I'll do this one, and then I'll hand it off. Uh, this one is pretty straightforward. It shows a, a kind of an evolution up the, the food chain. We're starting with, with the central hub and spoke architectures, very common in, in industrial control kinds of applications. We're getting more to mesh interconnected, connected factory kinds of things. Certainly some of the smart cities are meshy. Uh, then we're, we're starting to look at this integration between cloud, fog, data center, and so on. And eventually we get to this point of autonomous distributed fog where there's this huge ether of lots of computation networking and storage at hierarchical levels up and down the network all uh, vertically, horizontally, and diagonally interconnected. So this kind of represents sort of the autonomic nervous system of the planet from an IoT perspective. And, and the orchestration and management responsibility goes up along that wedge. If we, when we get to this point, right now I'd say we're kind of somewhere in the middle of that point. When we get up here, we really have to make certain that the Open Fog Management and Orchestration Working Group really has their act together because if that's not correctly handled, we are destined for failure. Fortunately, I think it's being correctly handled. You guys want to step up and speak to some of these details, or should we just keep going here? You're doing great, Chuck. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm not going to read all the words. This is about the subtle distinctions between scheduling and orchestration. Scheduling is kind of a, a thing that's been happening with, you know, since timeshare computers in the 1970s, I suppose you could argue. Uh, it's really not aware of service level objectives. All it knows is in 16 milliseconds, it's time to swap a process in. That's what it knows. Uh, orchestration, on the other hand, is very cognizant. It's almost like a, a machine learning or artificial intelligence kind of capability where it's really taking the full context of the system, the full loads of a single fog node and its adjacent fog nodes and even the whole network into account. And in doing so, it can make really important decisions about how those resources up and down that fog hierarchy are invested in the computational tasks of all of the applications that are running on that hierarchy. So, so we're really aware of our service level objectives. And that's a key capability of open fog orchestration. And once again, one of the things that's essential to the ultimate success of the fog model. A little bit more about how all this fits together. Uh, Insight, control, context, and automation are, are some of the capabilities that we think that orchestration and, and the service delivery capabilities of management systems we're going to put together. Once again, I'm not going to read the entire slide. We can find them on, uh, on the web. But what we're really interested in is, is how all of these different capabilities are meshed together into a unified whole and managed simultaneously. Uh, it's a real trick. There's, there's millions of lines of code implied in the ability to get all that stuff working as the Open Fog Consortium's vision would expect it to. And indeed, uh, that, that's the, the architecture work that uh, we're rolling up our sleeves and are right in the middle of in the, in the, in the consortium and also in the manageability working group. So here's a, a slide that sort of shows how some of these interfaces are stuck together. So what we're really looking for is to automate almost all of the automation, uh, all, all the orchestration and management capabilities. 
there simply are not enough swivel chairs to put enough trained people in to manage all of this stuff manually. The management's going to have to be automated to the point where I, I plug a, a new fog note on a street corner or, or in, in a factory underneath the machine somewhere, and it all has to discover, authenticate, provide credentials, make, maintain security, understand its place in the network, understand the resources that it has at its disposal, load the right kind of application software, the right kind of device drivers, the right kind of analytics algorithms, start it going, and continuously monitor its performance. So, so this has all got to be automated. If, if somebody in a swivel chair has got to do a single keystroke and there's 10 million fog nodes in the world, there's not enough swivel chairs, right? So, so this slide is really about different vectors associated with that kind of intelligent, what Caddy called self-aware networking. So there's the, the capability point, there's this sort of programmability point, there's this question of resource allocation, and then this, this question of, of functional control. And all of those things are going to fall together into the open fog management and orchestration suite. So that's the end of the formal presentation. And let's uh, have a round for the, 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 the folks here. Thank you for coming. And we, uh, we do have about 10 minutes before lunch if anybody has any questions or, or comments. In fact, we'd love a good argument if anybody is in the mood for that. I see one right down here, yes. Okay, so the, the question is, are we looking at a, for, a fog orchestrator as a specific output of this exercise? Uh, most certainly, some implementations of fog software infrastructure will have a module on them that's called the orchestrator, right? And somebody somewhere is going to have to architect and do high level and low level requirements and, and, and then write the, I don't know, 500,000 lines of code or something that it'll probably end up being. Um, but that's one implementation model. Another way that you might implement FOG is to realize that orchestration is more of a pervasive capability. So it could be, for example, that a security module might have orchestration capabilities in it, or a performance management module might have orchestration capabilities in it. So, so there are way, different ways to define that. When the Open Fog Consortium publishes our next generation, the, the, the next set of that multicolor block diagram, which is expected uh, uh, sometime early next year, there will be additional blocks for management and orchestration, and those blocks will be broken down into sub-blocks. And I think that th at that point, you'll probably have a pretty good idea about how it all goes together. Did that answer your question? Uh, Maybe not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are you also looking at reusing existing orchestrators in the sense okay. some of the components are available which you can blend in together to form the entire, uh, uh, bring all these modules together, mm -hmm. or you're looking for a standalone independent implementation that's purely native? Right. So that's, that's this question about, the question was, are we going to use existing orchestrators that might be provided by a, any number of commercial companies, including, I might say, my company, Cisco, has one, or are, are we looking at something you know, different or, or, or new? Uh, the answer is the Open Fog Consortium is trying to maintain openness, all right? So that's part of our name. What we don't want is say, okay, Fog is open for all aspects, except you only can use this particular orchestration capability from Microsoft or Cisco or IBM or Foghorn or you know, any, any other number of companies that might have such a capability. Uh, that would not represent an open architecture. Unless, of course, the multiple companies who are making professional orchestration systems would have a mechanism that they could pull that all together into some kind of open intellectual property free capability. Uh, in that case, uh, we would certainly embrace it. I think we're, 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 we're struggling with exactly how to manage the balance between the goodness that's out there in the market right now, momentum, track record, credibility in the industry, but potentially proprietary, versus we'd love to have a fully open, maybe open source based thing like Jim talks about, but that's immature at this point, and it doesn't have a lot of track record, so, so we're in the middle of trying to balance that. Let's move on to an, another question. Uh, over here, yes, please. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the uh, hypervisor capabilities and what are you guys thinking about that? 
I can try and address a little bit of that. So I, I think um, when we look at hypervisor, I would not say that that is an absolute requirement. In fact, many of the software um, capabilities we look at, many of the infrastructure capabilities we look at, and any of the um, open fog diagrams are always almost listed as options. That's the difficult part with this environment when you're dealing with so many different types of platforms across so many different types of needs. It's really tough to say you must have because if you tried to run, for example, some of those hypervisors on some of the lowest level PLCs, good luck with that, right? So uh, hypervisor we're viewing as a potential part of a solution that might be to some of those uh, either virtualized or logical nodes that I mentioned. Uh, but is it required? No. Uh, and so we're looking at that as you kind of see when we, we talked about or had up there on the diagram, some of that node management and software backplane, again, it steps into the, some of the area of the manageability, um, addressing some of those concerns. So it is an option to look at, well, how do we provide for some of that abstractness that we need between the, the hardware and the software layers where the resources are available? And then how do we incorporate that as part of the actual orchestration and management as well? Does that answer your question, sir? Sure. Um, yeah, let's take yours. Uh, if I understood your schedule, you're saying you, you have this frozen by about January of next year. And is there any plan for schedule to filling in the APIs or, or are they uh -huh. in phases? Okay, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what's available right now. Uh, the Open Fog reference architecture, 162 pages, supplemented by a bunch of use cases, has been available on the consortium website since February of 2017. We just released a set of four use cases this morning that represent the next layer of peeling of the onion. So the use cases that we had before were a couple of pages written in sort of marketing speak. The ones that we published today are 15 and 20 pages long, full of technical details enough to extract requirements from. Okay, So we're going to have normative requirements coming out of those use cases. And that extraction is happening throughout November and early December, and we expect to publish that in January, probably announced at a thing called the IoT Evolution Expo, which is the next major conference in this sort of space, which is happening in Orlando on January 22nd. Hopefully we'll have it ready to go at that point. Right after that, we're going to have uh, hopefully a set of a few hundred normative formal requirements under our belt, and those will be used to drive our test bed organization, as well as to drive the architecture's next step. And that's what's gonna generate this so what we'll see is an architecture framework for interoperable fog systems document. I would expect it'll be published in around March. That's, you know, don't quote me on that. That very much depends upon how much time we're going to get out of these people and the good people in the working groups that uh, they manage um, and, and uh, a bunch of other complexities. And beyond that, that framework has a bunch of stuff hung on it. So there will be a, a, a manageability document and a messaging document and a doc, couple of documents about security, one for a node level protection profile, system level protection profile. And all this stuff will be hooked together so over the coming six to nine months, you'll see this avalanche of documentation coming out of the Open Fog Consortium. And somewhere along that progression, you'll get to the point where you'll say, aha, I think I have enough. It's okay to start my development at this point. And, and maybe, maybe the 162 pages is enough to start your development right now. Okay. Uh, more questions. Uh, I see a gentleman in the back right there. Yeah. Um, so I have a question on the security framework. So do you have a mechanism where you allow someone to distinguish when you have a security breach, whether it's due to operational issues or actual security breach? You're talking about security breach, right? Yeah. I saw a module mentioned as uh, data integrity. So in my opinion, when you look at IoT security, it's really very closely tied to specific verticals that we're how do you sort of, uh, sort of provide uh, validation when you see certain anomalies, whether they're due to security breaches or whether they're due to operational issues? So is there a framework to allow that kind of? Okay, now I, I give you my personal opinion a little bit, but our colleagues are here, they will also give their comments, okay? Um, First of all, is that uh, what some of the things that you are talking about belong to security monitoring. We will have a security monitoring mechanism built in. That means uh, we know that this is a dynamic thing. So some of these things, would we will leverage on some of the incident reporting system that people are building. The second thing is we 
So that's the reason why I mentioned about the security as a service uh, paradigm in, in this morning. We are thinking about the fog node, especially with respect to the IoT devices. They will be like the guardian of the IoT devices. First of all, we will have strong root of trust. We will make sure that the, the fog nodes and the, and, the, and the cloud servers, they can be you know, strongly authenticated with one another. And also, hopefully, they know what are the IoT device they have, you know, each individual fault nodes are managing. Okay. They are responsible. You know, I know that in different application domain, the way to establish that trust, that last leg of trust, really varies. But somehow we, we assume that the fault node, when they're trying to uh, pledge for their IoT devices, they have in their own domain enough trust saying that, you know, I'm their guardian. I pledge for them. You know, I'm looking after them. So, uh, you know, uh, so please, because you trust me, work with them, okay? Yep. Um, that's what we are now, we are now doing, because the, the, the very fact that there are so many different ways IoT device can connect to the upper echelon makes this thing, I don't, I don't think I can give you a, a definite answer or a unified answer at the moment. But I don't know whether Frank and uh, Marcello, maybe, you know, all you guys can, can supplement on some of these answers. I think you gave a pretty, pretty good answer. Maybe just to, to, to give some details on the work of the consortium. Uh, we, are per, we are right now, in security normally should take place after this functionality has been defined. <coughs> so we are working on topics we can already work now. And uh, so our way of working is to first secure the phone node. And once we have the phone node that we consider secure, we can secure the phone system. So as uh, John mentioned, what you are mentioning about detecting uh, devices that have been breached, this is more like monitoring the <coughs> service, monitoring the devices and take action on them. So this is definitely something we're going to do, we're going to tackle. Currently we are focusing on securing the phone now. Uh, we showed, we, the, the, the team showed some picture of a uh, route of trust, of building some things, being, uh, the whole stuff is, uh, about the fog in security, very interesting is the fact that it is remote. Most of it is remote. And that's where you mentioned pointing out very good, very well. That so something getting breached, how do you handle that? Because you don't have to handle it. I think it's not only that, uh, but also to have the capability to run vortex scenarios. Okay. What, what? Vortex scenarios. The capability to run vortex scenarios. If you have a security breach. Oh, okay. Where it could penetrate, how far it could go, what damage it could incur, not just monitoring, but safety. And yeah, so this is something that we have uh, mission critical services, we will not shut them down. We have to make even though they are breach, we have to let them leave so mm -hmm. because of what puts mm -hmm. the system in there. So typically these kind of uh, actions, but it's all happening in the top system management, security management platform. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. More questions? Ah, in the back, yes. I just have a question about um, one of the the roadmap for the fog is, is how far mm -hmm. are we looking to sort of take it from a, a I've heard the words like implementation aspect mm -hmm. of things and mm -hmm. the roadmap to kind of get to that point. Are you looking to, like in this organization, define protocol level details, like that of the messaging and, and API references, you know, or are you looking to kind of piggyback off of existing standards to do that? So just from a consortium perspective, what's the outlook there? Like, I have been to Okay. Anybody want to take that or should I give it a shot? Uh, the, the answer is the consortium's board of directors tells us sort of what our scope is. And uh, we've decided that we're trying to make FOG architecture solid, shall we say, from the highest level conception all the way through architecture, high-level design, low-level design, implementation, deployment. And we also have uh, a test bed and certification capability that we're working on. So I think the answer is, is we're intending to go everything from here's a set of canonical use cases through here's all of the details you need to implement it, and I'll tell you about e APIs in a second, through here's a set of, uh, of test criteria and test processes that you might use in order to validate that your FOG implementation is open FOG compliant. And if it is so validated, 
there will be a seal of approval, the, the fog mark, maybe what it would be called, which could be a hologram that you stick on your software package or on the back of your device. So the consortium is trying to manage most of that ecosystem uh, from, from a high level. Uh, in terms of, of what it takes in terms of APIs and protocols and stacks and, and software analytics modules and so on, uh, we are only going to invent what's absolutely necessary because it doesn't exist, <laughs> okay? Where it does exist, for example, we've got liaison arrangements with the Etsy multi-axis edge computing MEC organization. And they have a dozen or so uh, APIs already defined. I think about five of them are documented to the point where we could actually just reuse them. So if we need an API on some inner aspect associated with one of those white lines, we're not so ornery that we're going to say, ignore the rest of the world and the years of track record that they have in doing that. We're going to say, let's embrace it where possible. We have a, a the liaison that we have with MEC is, is in a, a pretty good place. So we could say, we love all this. This is great, but we need you to, to modify those six or eight capabilities of your API to make them work in the FOG model. And they've already agreed that they're going to work with us to do that. Similarly, we have a, a liaison relationship with IEEE, who happens to be a co-sponsor of this organization, of, 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 this, of this meeting. And uh, IEEE is, is working to help us with the, the full standardization, the, the boilerplate around what it means to be a standard. It's a thing that, it turns out, takes a bunch of special skills and a bunch of special capabilities that the Open Fog Consortium is only nascent, but IEEE is very mature on. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a handoff to IEEE, and when we have this set of normative requirements, IEEE is going to adapt that into full standards language and manage it through perpetuality as a standard. So, so we've got a lot of help coming from the organizations that we have liaisons with to manage all of those little details and, and help us uh, avoid reinventing the wheel. There is, uh, there is a working group. It's, uh, it's IEEE 1934, if I yeah. recall the name correctly. Is that right? Right. Yeah. right. Uh, actually, I'm, the, uh, I'm the, uh, uh, the chairman of the new working group. Okay, so let me mention a few words about uh, what uh, Chuck has, uh, has uh, talked about. We are working with IEEE, especially the Communication Society. To have, we have already established the, uh, the first working group called the P1934 working group, which is the framework architecture working group for fog computing and networking. Our first step is to indeed immediately adopt the, uh, the reference architecture version one to make it the first document. But as Chuck has mentioned, the next step is we really uh, want to define our framework architecture document and then also move it into IEEE. So for these two documents, we are going through the so-called adop adoption process. That means we are giving them kind of like a master document they can work with. But then after that, I think the, the drive is just like you know, the, the AO2 effort, we will, we'll hope that we will see that dot one, dot two, dot three, dot 11, dot 14, whatever. What we are working with IEEE is to identify specific uh, parts of the technology that should be standardized. So as Chuck has mentioned, we don't want to reinvent the, re -invent the wheel. There's a lot of other uh, technology and standard has been proposed already. We would like to reuse them. But we keep on also asking ourselves, what are uniquely FOG that we have to define? Mm -hmm. And for, that, for those specific uniquely FOG pieces, then we will work with IEEE and perhaps other bodies to make them public. So that, by the way, one of the things we do is, for example, in security, where we are developing the protection profile, uh, similar to the, uh, to the CC approach, so that uh, there are certain aspects, okay, the assurance level aspect, that is not defined usually in, in IEEE or whatever, and we will do that as well. Okay. Yeah. I think we're approaching the end of our time here. First of all, let me thank everybody for coming and listening and being fans of architecture. Uh, and it's appreciated, and I, I love uh, this opportunity to interact with the community. Uh, second, a very, very brief commercial. The Open Fog Consortium is perhaps 50 or 60% of the way down our journey, but the remainder 
is requiring quite a bit of innovation and quite a bit of heavy lifting and quite a bit of contribution from the community at large. So if anybody is interested in helping us invent the future, we are a very open, very easy to deal with organization. If you, uh, there are many layers of, of membership. So if you consider joining the Open Fall Consortium as a company, as an individual, as, a, as an academic institution or whatever, uh, we have lots of opportunities for you to get involved and to contribute to this invention of the future. And if anybody is interested in doing so, you know, come and see me and I'll, I'll give you the full arm twist. Thanks for coming. I think lunch is next, and it's uh, just sort of out and to the right. Thanks, Mike.